Thank you. So, <clears throat> uh, what is free software? Free software is software that respects users' freedom and community. So it's a matter of freedom, not price. We don't mean gratis software. We're not talking about whether you pay money or not to get a copy. We're not concerned with how you get a copy. That's a side issue. We're concerned with once you have a copy, how does it treat you? Does it respect your freedom or take it away? Does it respect your community or divide people? Those are the important moral issues. So it's Libra, not gratis. We often use the borrowed f French or Spanish word Libra to indicate we're talking about free as in freedom. But what is a program? What's a computer? Well, a computer is a universal computing engine. But conceptually, it's very simple. It can only do one thing. Get the next instruction and do what that says. Then get the next instruction and do what that says. And the next instruction and the next millions of times of sec a second, it will get an instruction and do what that says. The instructions come from a program, which is a bunch of instructions. And depending on what instructions are in the program, it will make that same computer do this or that or that or the other thing or whatever. In fact, the right set of instructions will make that computer do anything within the realm of what's possible. The things that are impossible, you can't find instructions to do. So the question is, who gives the instructions to your computer? You might think it's you, when really it's someone else. <laughs> Take a look, even if you're sitting down. You don't want to miss this one. Uh, you might think your computer is obeying you, when really it's always obeying its true master. And it does what you want if the true master says OK. So the true master always rules. So with any program, there are two possibilities. Either the users control the program, or the program controls the users. It's always one or the other, because there's no other way it can be. When the users control the program, that program is free software. Why so? Well, what is freedom? Freedom means having control of the activities you do in your life. But if you do the activity with a program, control of the activity requires control of the program that's doing it for you. So when the users control the program, the program respects their freedom and community, and therefore it's free software. I'll explain in a minute how community fits into this. So in practical terms, in order for the users to control the program, they need the four essential freedoms. And these make the practical concrete criterion for a free program. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program any way you wish for any purpose. Freedom one is the freedom to study the program's source code and change it so it does your computing activity the way you wish. Now, why insist on source code? Well, on the left, you can see some source code. It's like a mixture of English and math. If you've learned the programming language, you can read that, understand what it would do, and change it to do something else. But to run the program, we generally convert it into an executable, which is a series of enigmatic ones and zeros. Or sometimes I maybe I should say an enigmatic series of ones and zeros. I'm not sure which is more correct. In any case, figuring out what those very few ones and zeros mean, because there are several instructions, perhaps, 
that's not so hard since it's so few. But when it gets to be more, it gets to be a substantial job. And for a real program, which might have a hundred million ones and zeros, figuring out what they mean is tremendously hard, so hard that people don't even think of trying except as a last recourse in a case of desperation. So the point is, well, even that's not enough. You know, just seeing that doesn't tell you what the thing, what those instructions are meant to do. The real source code would probably have comments that would enable a programmer to understand it. Stripping those out is, leaves you with something that's not the real source code, and uh, it doesn't satisfy this criterion. So, uh, if you release the program as an executable and say, you're free to change this if you can figure it out, that's not freedom one. So these two freedoms together give us separate control over the program, which means I control my copies, you control your copies, and you control your copies. Uh, here we see four users running the program with the, these freedoms, and one of them is exercising freedom one to change per copies. Well, separate control is essential, but it's not enough because most users are not programmers. They don't know how to study and change the source code for themselves because they do other things in life. And there are plenty of other things to do in life. I don't believe that everyone should have to learn to, or be expected to learn to program if you're interested, you should learn. If you're not interested, learn something else. <clears throat> but even the people that don't know how to program, when they use computing, they deserve control over it. How can they have that? Through collective control of the program. Collective control is the freedom to work with other users to exercise control over what the program does. Here we see a group of three users that are together deciding what changes to make, and the two on the right who are touching the code, they must know how to program. They're the ones implementing the change, but the, the user on the left who is not touching the code participates in the discussions about what changes to make. That's how non-programmers can participate in controlling the programs that do their computing. Those who collaborate are those who choose to. At the bottom, there are two more users who are not working with that group. Why not? Could be any reason, because each one of them is free to, to choose to work with others or not. Maybe they just never heard of each other. Maybe tomorrow they'll meet and start working together. Or maybe they want different changes, and it's not useful for them to work together. It's up to them. Collective control requires two more essential freedoms. Freedom two is to make exact copies and then give or sell them to others when you wish. Freedom three is to make copies of your modified versions and give or sell them to others when you wish. These two freedoms make it possible for a group to work together. If one member of the group makes a modified version with freedom three, person can make copies of that and distribute them to others in the group. And they, with Freedom 2, can make more copies of that version to redistribute to others in the group. Now, the group does not have to have any formal structure or a list of members. Whichever users are working together, they're a group. And they're taking advantage of the freedom to do so. Therefore, Freedoms 2 and 3 don't have any limits about who you can redistribute to. You can redistribute to anyone, if you wish. You can even offer copies to the general public, if you wish. So, if the program carries these four essential freedoms, then it is free software because the users control the program. I better recapitulate these four freedoms because they're fundamental. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish for any purpose. Freedom one is to study the source code of the program and change it so it does your computing activities the way you wish. Freedom two is to make exact copies and give or sell them to others when you wish. And freedom three is to make copies of your modified versions and give or sell them to others when you wish. 
So if the program comes with those freedoms, it's free software. <clears throat> but if one of those freedoms is missing or insufficient, then the users do not control the program. Instead, the program controls the users and the program's owner controls the program. What we have here is a system of unjust power. Power for the owner developer of the program over whoever uses the program. In other words, because this program is non-free, it generates a system of unjust power. This is why every non-free program is an injustice. The free software movement's goal is to put an end to non-free software. We all deserve to control our computing. We deserve to do it with free software. Because a non-free program subjugates people, do, developing non-free software is worse than doing nothing. If you're doing nothing, you're doing neither good nor harm. If you're developing or promoting non-free software, you're doing harm. You should stop. There's no excuse for that. Unless you're in a strange situation where somebody points a gun at you and says, write this non-free program or I'll shoot. In that case, I mean, I guess I'd forgive you for writing the non-free program. I might do the same. But just because you want some money, well, there are other jobs, you know. You should get an ethical job. There are even ethical jobs in programming. So this is the fundamental injustice of any non-free program, but it leads to other injustices. Because nowadays, the owners know that they have power over the users. They're fully aware of what advantage they can get by taking advantage of that power to mistreat the users. So they put in malicious functionalities, intentionally coding the program to mistreat the users for their own benefit, the, the developer's benefit. And this is so common this is the usual case nowadays. It's not a rare exception that might happen. You should assume that any non-free program is designed to mistreat you in various ways. You may once in a while find an exception. If so, congratulations. Although, how can you really be sure? So what are these malicious functionalities? One is spying on users extremely common. Most non-free programs seem to spy on users. This example is the Amazon Swindle, Amazon's ebook reader, which reports everything the user does, Orwellian surveillance of reading. I call it the Amazon Swindle rather than by its official name because this fits it better. It's designed to swindle readers out of the traditional freedoms of readers of books and the Orwellian surveillance is just part of that. It sends the title of the book to Amazon. Even if the user got the book from someplace else, Amazon still knows that person is reading it. It sends the page number being read. It, if the user enters any notes or highlights any text, that's sent to Amazon too. So this is not even a secret. Amazon admits this. But this is just one example. Flash player spies on the user. The five very successful proprietary operating systems, which are Windows, Mac OS, Android, iOS, and Chrome OS, each one spies on the user in its own way. And then plenty of application programs spy on the user. In fact, somebody studied hundreds of the most successful Android apps and found that of the paid apps, 60% of them were spying in one particular easy to detect way. And of the gratis apps, 90% were spying in that one way. And uh, the investigator could only detect one particular kind of spying. There are lots of other ways that the program could be written to send personal data, but without the source code, it wasn't easy to tell. 
but there's one kind of spying that the investigator could easily see and could check a lot of programs. And most of them were spying. This is why I say mistreating the user is the usual case in non-free software. All those programs were non-free software. And then especially bad are streaming apps because they make users identify themselves and they keep a dossier about the user and you can't just give any name you like because you have to identify yourself to pay basically and so as a result this is an Orwellian system collecting personal data we should not permit to be collected it threatens society it's a great way to make a list of dissidents and crush people who oppose dangerous things like oil extraction. So uh, this is why I say out, out, damn Spotify and flick off Netflix. I would never consider using those. In fact, I won't even listen to something through those systems when it's running on somebody else's computer. I feel that I have to show my uh, opposition to them by rejecting such offers. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing enough to fight against these bad practices. Then there are also, oh, then there are the transport apps like uh, Uber and Lyft and maybe others. Basically, keeping track of where people go is extremely threatening to human rights and democracy. We must make sure that the transportation systems are anonymous. Many, uh, in addition to these programs that are tethered to a particular server, there are many physical products with the same problem and uh, of course the manufacturer spies on them totally. Fitbit was the first example I knew of. It sent personal data to the manufacturer which offered to sell it back to the user. What gall? I mean you think, find a thing like that, throw it in the trash immediately. <clears throat> oh and by the way uh, China is keeping track of Chinese people when they're not in China using Fitbits. Uh, I read that this feeds into the social credit system that rewards and punishes people for every kind of choice they make. And uh, there are many such products. It's called the Internet of Stings. Internet of Stings. <clears throat> Basically, the accepted practice now is to design the product so that the user communicates with it through the manufacturer's server, which means the manufacturer gets to spy on everything the user is doing and on the results. There's even a sex toy which was designed to accept control remotely by internet. Now, I guess in certain circumstances that could be enjoyable, but the communication with the other person goes through the manufacturer's server, which means the manufacturer knows all, including probably who that other person is. Just think about that. Do you want to announce your relationship to that company? and to whoever else that company will inform. So uh, when I saw that thing on sale, I thought, oh, this is, this is for suckers. This is going to spy on people. But that was a suspicion, not proof. Later on, somebody proved it and found that the product was designed for spying. It was designed with a thermometer. Now, why do the users want a thermometer? The users don't need a thermometer. It's not for them, it's only for spying on them. With the thermometer, the manufacturer can tell 
whether the product is in contact with a human body. And I suspect it can also tell, more or less, how the product is in contact with a human body. So this is the most intimate, the most uh, intimate surveillance you could imagine. But you should know that if a product talks to the internet, it's designed to spy on you. <clears throat> I wouldn't accept any such product unless I could make sure it didn't connect. And um, <clears throat> another thing it can do to these products is sabotage them remotely. Because the user, the owner of the so called owner of the product, has to get an account. Well, the manufacturer could turn off your account, and then you couldn't control the product. It can do that to everybody at once by switching off the server, and this has happened. If the manufacturer decides it costs too much to run the server, and it's not worth it, it, can, it some manufacturers, including Google, have switched off the server, leaving all the products inoperative. Then there is the malicious functionality of not letting you do the things you want to do. This, where the product is designed so people can't do things they obviously will want to do. This is known as DRM, Digital Restrictions Management, or Digital Handcuffs, Digital Shackles. This example is the Blu-ray that attacks users when they try to copy a disc. Well. That's comedic license. It doesn't actually sh shine a ray at the user. It just won't let the user access the data in the ways users want to do. The only way to access it at all is with uh, special products designed to restrict users. Now, my rule for myself is I won't use a product designed to restrict me unless I have available whatever is necessary to break the shackles. So I won't use a Blu-ray disc unless I have what's necessary to use it in the ways I want to, like make a copy, perhaps. But that software doesn't exist. There is no free software I can use to do that. So I've never used a Blu-ray disc, and I never will until the day we can do it with free software. Actually, some of the, for, partly the free software exists, but they change the keys. So you can use it for some disks and not others. And then there's some disks that have a second level of DRM. So it's not easy. We can't assume that our cleverness will always defeat their cleverness. We need to organize and fight these practices as practices. I can't hear you. What? Hacking. Well, hacking it, but not making money out of it. I don't understand. I, I, I'm lost. It's protected. Or not it's restricted. I won't restricted. use the word protection to describe restricting us. I don't see it from their point of view. I refuse. They're the enemy. Yeah, okay. They I mean, want to restrict us. Well, I just hope so. In, it's not a matter of breaking in. It's a matter of copying it or even watching it if you're in the wrong country. Yeah. Now, yeah. hacking, do How? I don't use the word hack the way you do. I'll talk about that later oh. if there's time. Oh. There isn't time today for me to talk about all the things I need to. I'm afraid I may have to leave that one. Okay. For me, hacking means playful cleverness, and you can do it in any field. That's what we hackers used it to mean in the 1970s. Uh, so uh, DRM is found in the five major non-free operating systems and in lots of apps, and in the Amazon Swindle, too. It's almost a universal example. I could use it to explain most kinds of malicious functionalities. Then there are back doors. A backdoor listens for commands from some remote place, commands to do something nasty to the user. 
Ah, uh, well, in theory, it could be a command to do something nice to the user, but if the users were going to want it, they wouldn't need to make it a back door. They just put a command in the menu and say, do this if you want to. But in fact, they know that the things they're going to do are not nice, that users would never choose to do them. They have to do it to the users by force, and so that's why it's a back door. It's not easy to find a back door. We can't study the code, the source code of these non-free programs. So the only way we know about these backdoors is by observation of them in function. So in 19, sorry, in 2009, users observed that Amazon had remotely erased thousands of copies of a particular book in a grand Orwellian act. They did the, Amazon did this through a backdoor. And this is how we know that the Amazon swindle has a backdoor to remotely erase books. And what was the book? It was 1984 by George Orwell. This sparked a lot of criticism, so Amazon said it would never do this again unless ordered to by the state. Now, if you've read 1984, that's not very comforting, is it? But it wasn't sincere anyway. Uh, it was just some noise to make to pull the momentum out of the criticism. A few years later, Amazon resumed remotely erasing books without even an order from the state. Now, there are other backdoors we know of. Uh, the iMonsters have a backdoor for remotely erasing any app or maybe it's just irrevocably deactivating the app, hardly makes any practical difference. Uh, and Android can do that, but it can also forcibly install any app. So Google has a lot of power. This backdoor is in Google Play, which is one of the non-free components of Android. Now, a backdoor in a driverless car could be extremely dangerous because you might say, I want to go to the train station and some big brother would send a command saying, take him to the secret police black site. And that would override, it would keep the doors locked, you would be trapped. You can't trust driverless cars. And it's not a matter of accidents. We can be pretty sure they will try to eliminate the accidents, and they may make them much rarer than with human-driven cars. But you can't trust it because you don't know whose side the software in the car is on. Now, do you think that they will do this? In China, I'm sure they'll do this. By the way, Uh, well, never mind. I was going to tell a joke in French about that. But uh, Another malicious functionality is censorship. Apple pioneered censorship of apps in the iThings. And uh, so, in other words, the user of an iPhone was not free to install whatever apps person wanted to install, but could only install the apps approved by Apple from Apple's store. Apple practiced the censorship power arbitrarily according to its commercial interests and political positions until 2017, at which point China commanded Apple to block VPN apps. And Apple just had to obey. It couldn't refuse. And that's because it couldn't pretend it was unable to do this. You see, if Apple had designed those computers like all the other computers where users could install what they wanted to and didn't need approval, then China would have had an excuse to say, I'm sorry, China, you know we can't control what users install. We always want to please you, China, but in this case, we just can't do it. But because Apple had given itself censorship power, it was compelled to use that power for China. When users found a way to evade the censorship and install 
apps of their choice. They called it jailbreaking, recognizing in effect that these computers are jails for the user, and that's our term for a computer system that censors installation of apps. Then there are universal backdoors. That means a backdoor that has the power to do absolutely anything because it has the power to change the code. So if, if there's some nasty thing that you want to do to the users, well, write code to do it, forcibly install that change, and then it will happen. Windows has a universal backdoor. Microsoft even announces this under a different name that sounds nicer. It's called Auto Upgrade. Sometimes one program has several malicious functionalities at the same time. For instance, the Netflix app surveils the user by building a dossier of what the user watches. It imposes DRM chains. And it requires users to agree to an anti-socializing contract. What is that? That's a contract where you agree that you will be a jerk that you will be a bad member of your community by not cooperating with other people. Uh, so in that contract, you agree that you won't make and share copies. You won't even lend the one copy you have to someone else or give it to someone else. Now, if you've agreed to a contract like that, that's no excuse for carrying it out. It's wrong to be a jerk. You can't excuse that by saying you promised somebody you would be a jerk for some advantage for you. No, you have to break that agreement. But I don't like agreeing to something when I'm aware that I would be morally bound to disregard that agreement. I'd rather refuse to agree to it in the first place, and that's what I do. I've never knowingly agreed to such a thing. I check because it's too disgusting. I'd be ashamed to live that way. And this is another reason not to use streaming disk services, because if you don't have a copy, how can you share copies? To be a good member of your community, you should be able to share copies. And that means you got to have copies, your own local copies. Another malicious functionality is addictiveness. And that is found in things like games, as well as in apps for social media. Now, the behavior of a social network is not entirely up to the, the local client program. But you could make it, to some extent, less addictive by changing the local client program if it were free software. So that non-free program is partly responsible for the harmful addictiveness. Another malicious treatment, which is not exactly a functionality of the code, is when Microsoft discovers a security flaw in Windows, before fixing it, it informs the NSA, the US Electronic Spy Agency, uh, of, the pro of the flaw so it can enter computers that run Windows. So Microsoft is directly betraying all of its users. Whether other companies are doing this, we have no information. It's an absence of evidence, which is not evidence of anything. It's only in the case of Windows and Microsoft that we have evidence. Now, these are a few examples. We've got hundreds of examples. Look at gnu.org slash malware for these hundreds of examples, which are classified in various ways. And each one has a reference to document it. So if you're using proprietary software, you're almost surely using proprietary malware. Almost everybody that's using proprietary software is using proprietary malware. Uh, so they're already being victimized. And why do the developers do this? Because it's profitable. They have ways to make more money by designing the software to mistreat the users. Now, at this point, I need to explain that any program, regardless of what its code says, can be released as free software. 
and can be released as non-free software, and it can even be distributed in both of those ways at once in parallel. This is because the difference between free and non-free software is purely a matter of how the program is made available for users to use. It has nothing to do directly with what's in the code. So whatever the code says, it can be released as free software and it can be released as non-free software. What this, whereas the difference between malware and honest software is purely a matter of what the code says. What jobs is it written to do? Honest ones or nasty ones? So that means that these are two theoretically independent dimensions. Is it free or non-free? That's a binary dichotomy. And is it malware or honest? In principle, they're independent. In practice, they are strongly correlated. Free software is almost always honest and proprietary software tends to be malware. Why is this correlation? Well, the proprietary software developers have power over the users and their power corrupts them. They know that they can take advantage of that power to mistreat the users and most of them give in to the temptation. They know that the users can't remove the malicious functionality. Systems have even been designed to make sure users can't remove that malicious functionality. <clears throat> and the users, as a result, are helpless. They're under the heel of the developer, at the mercy of the developer. Now, some developers are nastier and some are less nasty, but in either way, the users have no defense against whatever nasty thing the developer might do to them through a non-free program. And as a result, uh, <clears throat> you can't have a rational basis to trust a non-free program. You have to recognize that the, the developer could be mistreating you in a bunch of ways. You probably can't tell for many. Some of them you would see. Some, though, you wouldn't see. Spying, for instance, you wouldn't see for the most part. <clears throat> By contrast, we developers of free software, we don't have power, and we know we don't. And this means we are protected from being corrupted. We don't feel the temptation to put in malicious functionalities since we know that the users are ultimately in control and they could remove our malicious fu functionalities and denounce us and they can protect themselves. In fact, this is the only known defense against malicious functionalities in software, that the users have control over it. That means they can defend themselves as a community, not just individually. <clears throat> and that, of course, discourages us from even trying to mistreat them. The result is that in the proprietary software world, the ethical standard is somewhere down at don't actually shoot the user. As long as you don't do that, it's OK. Their ethical standards have fallen through the floor through decades of giving in more and more to the temptation to mistreat their users. It's not even, it's, it's just taken for granted that of course they're going to mistreat users in every product. And every internet connected product nowadays is spying on users. I read recently that uh, TV manufacturers won't make non-smart TVs because they want to make money by profiling the users and selling that. So they want to give users no choice. <clears throat> if something is called smart, you should read that as spy. Likewise, a smart city, well, if they say that, you should call it a spy city, because that's what it really is going to be one way or another. They're looking for ways to profile you and we should prohibit them from doing it. In any case, since you can't have rational confidence in a non-free program, the only way you can use it is based, the only way you can trust it is based on blind faith. 
And usually it's blind faith in a company that has already mistreated people, so you know it doesn't deserve that faith. But with free software, rational trust is possible because you know that the users control the program and have a way to protect themselves and each other, and that this will and that this is the best defense known against malicious functionalities. It it's not only the possibility to fix bad things. Of course, more often you'll fix an error. You'll find an error th than uh, anything malicious, but you can fix both kinds of things. But also, it's a deterrent to trying to do anything nasty to the users. Now, this defense is not perfect. It's not a guarantee. Although if the community organizers to make, organizes to make effective use of it, it will work better. But the point is, this is the only defense known. And if you use a non-free program, you are defenseless. You're basically asking to be had. So what you need to do is escape from non-free software and come live with us in the free world that we have built. We built it with the GNU operating system, which is used together with the kernel Linux. I started developing GNU in 1984 with the goal of making it possible to use a computer in freedom. Most operating systems were developed for either technical or commercial reasons. GNU is the operating system that was developed for a moral reason, so we can have freedom because it saves us the need to run a non-free operating system. By 1991, GNU was almost finished. We were developing, it, it was missing the kernel. The kernel is the component of a system that allocates the machine's resources to the other programs. We were developing a kernel, but I had chosen a design that was too elegant and it took many years even to have a test version. But fortunately, we didn't have to wait. In 91, Torvalds released a kernel called Linux. Unfortunately, it was not free software. We couldn't use it. However, in 92, he changed the license and made it free software. And people started using Linux to fill the last gap in GNU, making a free operating system. For the first time, you could buy a PC and run it in freedom. Well. You've probably heard people referring to this operating system as Linux. That's a misnomer. Uh, and it's treating us unfairly because we're the ones who started this. We stated the goal. We, just, we developed the biggest contribution of code. So I think we're entitled to equal mention. If you call it GNU slash Linux, you're giving us equal mention. Please make an effort to make a point of remembering to do that. It's not nice when our work has had this tremendous success and it's attributed solely to someone else, especially someone else who disagrees with all our ideals and our philosophy. Now. GNU slash Linux in principle is a free system, but in practice, usually not. You see, there are thousands of variants called distros. Each distro has its own development team, which decides what programs to put in. Well, most of them put in some non-free programs, resulting in a variant that is not a completely free operating system. So there are things in there that take away the user's freedom. In fact, there are thousands of non-free distros and around 10 free distros. You look at gnu.org slash distros for the details. So if you want to be sure that you're not installing any non-free software, you better pick one of the free distros listed there. <clears throat> the non-free distros do two kinds of harm. One is some of them are, well, it's because they're, some of them are very popular, like Ubuntu. So a lot of people have heard of that one, and they never heard anything about this issue. So they install Ubuntu, and they think, boy, now I've got to where I ought to be. They don't know that a non-free distro takes you closer to freedom, but stops before you get there. 
They don't know that there's any further to go. But worse than that, the non-free distro's communications have a lot of influence on people's thought in the community. So uh, the messaging of Ubuntu, it could say, you deserve freedom in your computing, but you can't get it from us. But they don't want to say that. Instead, they say, we try to offer the best possible user experience, meaning they're focusing on practical convenience, not on freedom. Well, how do you teach people values? By incorporating them in your words and your actions. The words and the actions of Ubuntu teach value convenience, not freedom. And they're effective at teaching people that. Of course, that's not alone. That's what you find uh, coming from business in our society. Don't think about whether we're taking away your freedom. Just think of where you can get now. Uh, Microsoft had a slogan, where do you want to go today? So we responded with, how do you want to live in five or ten years? So raise your hands if you're a software developer or want to be one. Raise your hand if you're not. Uh, in the interest of time, I better skip the stuff about free software licensing. But please see gnu.org slash licenses for information about free software licenses. There is a, a page called licenselist.html which says which licenses are free and which are not, and of the free licenses, what the advantages and disadvantages of each license are. And many people uh, have been misinformed about what licenses are free. You might have heard of the uh, two different BSD licenses. There's the original one and the modified one. There's an important difference between those. But both of them are free, are free licenses. And uh, there are two different licenses called the X11 license and the, and the uh, uh, XPAT license. Some people call them both the MIT license, which is confusion. You shouldn't use that term. Anyway, they're both free licenses. I would say that they have, uh, in most cases, they're not the best license to use. But they are free licenses. You'll find a lot of people think, who think they're not. And the reason is that they're not copyleft licenses. But that's different. Free includes copyleft licenses and weak licenses and some things that are sort of semi-copyleft. As long as the license gives users the four essential freedoms, it's a free license. If you want our advice on choosing a license for your work, look at gnu.org slash licenses slash license recommendations.html. And if you want to use the GNU GPL as the license for your work, make sure you do it the right way. Look at uh, gpl-howto.html in that same directory. Uh, if you've installed only free software in your computer, you may still be running non-free programs because a lot of web pages have programs in them. These programs can be free or non-free, like any other program. And some important ones are free, but most of them are non-free. And since I don't want to run any non-free programs, I got people to develop Libre.js, which is an add-on for Firefox. It checks the programs in each web page to see if they're free or trivial. And in those cases, it permits the program to run. But if a program is not free and not trivial, then LibreJS blocks it to protect the user's freedom. It also changes the color of an icon to red, so you can see that that page has a problem. You can whitelist the, those programs if you wish. It also searches heuristically in the pages of the site for where and how to complain to the webmasters. 
This makes it possible to send a complaint quickly. It's important to complain. In 10 minutes a day, you could complain to 10 sites. Please do this. It's very important to put pressure on the webmasters of sites saying, you designed your site in a way that does wrong to visitors, and because of that, I'm not going to use your site. Now, there's another way nowadays to lose control of your computing. Uh, it was not common 20 years ago. It's called SaaS, Service as a Software Substitute. It's when a service offers to do for you computing that you could have done in your own computer with the right program. And in the past, people used to do that computing in their own computers. And then if the program was free, you'd have control of your computing, as you deserve to have. But if you entrust your computing activity to somebody else's server, you never have control over how that server does it. So it's the same harm that comes from running a non-free program in your own computer to do the same job. So if you want to control your computing, you need to reject SAS. SAS leads to the same result as running a non-free program, although the technical cause of that result, the, the failure mode is different, but it's the same end result. So SAS is equivalent to running a non-free program. But actually, it's worse than that. It's equivalent to running a non-free program that spies on you and has a universal backdoor. Here's why. Well, the non-free program that spies on you is sending data about you and what you're doing to somebody, some server. Well, with SAS, you're going to have to, the user, I won't say you, I hope you won't do this. The user will have to send all the pertinent data about the problem, plus other personal data that the site insists on, and then, okay, that server has this data about the user. So it's equivalent to spying on the user. And the other thing is, when a program has a universal backdoor, that means uh, the developer can remotely change the code and thus make it do nasty things to the user. Or change how, more generally, change how the user's computing is done without getting the user's permission to change it, without even saying necessarily what the change is. Well, with SAS, with service as a software substitute, the server owner at any time could install different software in it. Software that would do the user's computing differently. So it's equivalent to the universal backdoor. Now it's correct that the owner of this computer has the right to install different software in it. That's not wrong. It should be that way. But because that computer is not doing per software, but instead doing other people's Sorry, it's not doing per computing. It's doing other people's computing. That's why it ends up being unjust to them. So how do you tell whether something is your own computing? In principle, could you do it inside your computer, assuming you had a powerful enough computer and the right free software to do it? If, in principle, you could, then it's your computing activity. It doesn't concern or inherently involve anyone else, and you should have total control over it. You deserve that. There are other things you do, which are joint activities of communication with others, and uh, you're not entitled to have total control over them. If you want to communicate with me, should I have total control over that, or should you have total control over that? Neither of us deserves that. We've it's a joint activity, of, and there's no obvious right way about how to divide it up, not in a general sense. So we, that's an area which is more complicated, and this argument about SAS doesn't apply to those joint activities, which are communication. So we want to be free, but there are obstacles. Uh, one obstacle is the term open source. You've probably heard it used. Well, it stands for 
uh, rejection of the free software movement. That term was coined in 1998 by people who liked free programs, but they disagreed with our moral position about non-free software. They wanted to talk about the same problems without alluding in any way to freedom, to justice and injustice, to right and wrong. And with their term open source that they, that they coined, uh, they could create a different discourse which presented the issue solely in terms of practical advantage and never raised any issues of right and wrong. So we say, if you develop and release a program, it's your moral duty to respect the freedom of the users to change and redistribute that program. It's got to be free software. Open source supporters never say anything like that. They're not just changing the term, they're changing the ideas too. So they say, if you develop and release a program, we suggest you consider whether it's in your practical interest to uh, let users change and redistribute that program because if you do, they might provide benefits to you such as improving the code quality. So their arguments carefully avoid the idea that users of a program are entitled to control over it. So we don't consider open source supporters the enemy. The enemy is proprietary software, but we need to make sure that they don't hide us from the public's view. We have to work very hard to make people aware that, no, we're not open source supporters. We're doing something that came first and is deeper and more important. <clears throat> Unfortunately, uh, and part of the reason it's so much work that we have to do is that most people use the term open source. Indeed, nowadays, most people have only heard the term open source, and the major media normally only use the term open source. And most people, if they hear about us, they think that we're supporters of open source, which we're not. So, I get mail from people who say they really appreciate my contribution to open source. I have to explain, I don't advocate open source and I never did. And this is what the, what I stand for is the free software movement and here's the difference. <clears throat> and uh, I have to say that so prominently that they do a double take or else they probably won't even notice that I demurred. But even worse, I've seen articles that called me the father of open source. <laughs> what to do. I send a letter to the editor saying, if I'm the father of open source, it was conceived through artificial insemination using stolen sperm without my knowledge or consent. <laughs> then I present the name and the ideas of the free software movement. That's the serious point of the letter, but it's fun to start with a joke. Ah. So schools should teach exclusively free software. And when I say schools, I mean any level from kindergarten or nursery school to uh, university and ad adult education. And when I say teach, that doesn't just mean formal instruction. It means anything the school does to lead people to, to use a particular program it should be leading them to use free software only. And this is because the school has a social mission to educate good citizens of a society that is strong, capable, independent, cooperating, and free. In computing, that means teaching free software and graduating students ready to be part of such a society. Students graduates accustomed to free software. And this should not be a mysterious policy that's followed because somebody gave an order. The class should teach the civic reasons for this policy and it should explain why the school must never teach dependence. And teaching a non-free program is de teaching dependence. It is 
It is implanting dependence in society. It's the school's responsibility to carefully refuse to do that. Teaching a non-free program is equivalent to teaching the students to smoke tobacco. But there's also moral education in citizenship, teaching the habit of helping other people. Well, uh, for that, each class has to have this rule. Students, if you bring a program to class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must share copies with the rest of the class, including the source code, in case someone here wants to learn. Because this class is a place where we share our knowledge. And therefore, you may not bring a non-free program to class, except to do reverse engineering on it, which is the way you bring out the hidden secret knowledge concealed by that program. The school, however, to set a good example, has to follow its own rule. It must bring only free software to class and share copies, including source code, with everyone in the class. But there's also the education of good programmers. How do you learn to, well, first of all, every program embodies knowledge. If it's free, it offers that knowledge to the students. If it's non-free, it withholds that knowledge from the students. So a non-free program is the enemy of the spirit of education, and it should not be tolerated in a school except for reverse engineering, which is a legitimate activity for a school. And how do you learn to write good, clear code? You do it by reading lots of code and writing lots of code. But only free software gives you the chance to read the code of large programs we really use. So free software is essential. If you're using a program and you want to know how does it do that, the source code should be there for you to read it so you can see how you can do that. And then you've got to write lots of code. To learn to write code for large programs, you've got to write lots of code for large programs. But when you're starting out, you don't know how to write a large program by yourself and do a reasonable job. So how do you start out? By writing small changes in existing large programs and then bigger and bigger ones. Only free software offers students the chance to write small and then larger changes in existing programs we really use. And ideally, this these changes would get put into use, and then they'd get bug reports, and then they'd fix the bugs, and then they'd learn the whole job of software development, not just the, the part that seems theoretically central, which is writing it in the first place as if you were going to get it correct the first time. So if you have a relationship with a school, it's your responsibility to campaign to pressure that school to move totally to free software. If you are a student or a teacher or an administrator or an employee or a parent of a student, this is your responsibility. And part of it has to be uh, spreading the word, teaching others to be aware of these issues until the movement gets big enough that you can win. And remember, if the school is using non-free software, it's probably spying on the students for a, to a company. If it's using, for instance, Android or Chrome OS or iOS, those programs are spying. And it's wrong for the school to reveal even the name of a student to a company. So if a school says, oh, now you have to make a Google account, injustice. That should be illegal right there. Human rights depend on each other. That means that if we lose some human rights, it becomes harder to defend the others. Now that we do so, much, so many important activities with software and computing, free software, in other words, control of our computing, has become one of the human rights we need in order to defend the others. And Sometimes freedom requires a sacrifice. People are being taught nowadays that you can't 
envision even sacrificing a little convenience for your freedom. This message produces people who will surrender their freedom without a fight. It's a terribly harmful thing. And we have to start counteracting it now. And one way we can do it is by rejecting things. If you adopt a firm policy of rejecting certain online disservices, certain products, because, they, because you can't control them, or because in addition they're addictive, they spy on you, they have, di they have digital shackles, they have backdoors, then you'll set an example for others, and in addition, you'll start freeing yourself. So how to help our cause? Well, if you have a talent for programming, contribute to free software pa projects. I suggest you contribute to 15 projects before you start try to launch your own. Then you'll know how to do a good job running it. But most people don't have a talent for programming. That's the fact. Fortunately, there are many other kinds of work we need that are even scarcer than programming talent. And there, so there are many ways you can make important contributions. You can organize to campaign for free software. We need speakers. We need people to manage local activist groups, you know, collect the dues, maintain the membership list, set up meetings, invite speakers, remind people, and so on. Different kinds of talents. You can help persuade schools and governments to move to free software. I've already explained about schools. In regard to the government, remember that the government does its computing for the people. It has a responsibility to make sure that computing is done right. It must not uh, drop the people's computing into any private hands. It must not allow private parties to have control over what's done. Basically, uh, government services and activities should not be privatized. It's asking for trouble. It's giving some company a chance to cut corners and pay its employees less and cheat the public. And it's going to do those things because how else is it going to make a profit? So the government, in order to have control over its computing, must reject non-free software and must reject service as a software substitute. It has to do its computing with exclusively free software in computers also run by the government. This is the computational sovereignty of the country. But if an agency with uh, a critical function uses non-free software, it's worse than just a loss of sovereignty. It's a threat to national security. Remember that Microsoft tells the NSA about security flaws in Windows. And what about all the other companies? We don't know. They might be doing the same thing, for all we can tell. So if, you're, if the army, the police, the firemen, the phones, the electricity, the water, the trains, if they use non-free software, it's a threat to national security. If you're an expert user of GNU slash Linux, you can help other users. You can start a GNU slash Linux user group and invite people to come for help. You could go to an existing GNU slash Linux user group to help users. If there's an existing one, but they erroneously call it a Linux user group, you can go there and help users, but explain to them why the group ought to change its name and teach people this until someday the group does change its name. And just by saying free software, you're helping us in an important way. Uh, because that's a way of bringing in the ethical ideas into a conversation that might have started out use, using the term open source and raising only issues of practical advantage. And this gives you an opportunity to explain the difference between these two philosophies. By the way, at the practical level, free software and open source are almost coterminous, but not 100%. There are some examples of 
open source programs which are not free. And there may be some examples of free programs that are not open source. This is because the definitions are written very differently and they're interpreted by different groups. So it would be amazingly unlikely if the line got drawn at exactly the same place, and it didn't. But those differences, even though they're non-zero, are small. You're not likely to come across those problems, except one. There are, in some Android devices, there are copies of Linux, because Android uses Linux as the kernel, which are open source but not free. And the reason is the executable, the, the source code of Linux is free, but the executable is not. Why is that? It's because the device checks for a signature on the executable. So if you change the executable, suppose you edit the source code, build it, and try to install that modified version's executable. The device will not let it run or won't let it access certain resources so it can't really do its job. How do you understand that? Well, the source code is obviously free. It's released under the GNU General Public License version 2. But the executable is something you can't change. So I eventually concluded the way to understand this is the source code is free. The executable is non-free. But the definition of open source only talks about the source code. So if, there, if the program has source code, and it meets the criteria, they, can't, they don't ask about the executable and whether it's restricted. So this is the main difference in practice between uh, what is open source and what is free. So there are many other kinds of work we need. They didn't fit here. So look at gnu.org slash help, and you'll find something you can do. Oh, by the way, we forgot to tell people we should have passed around these pieces of paper so people can write down their names. It's not too late because I'm going to have questions. Can you get these pieces of paper and pass around like four of them, one at the front and one at sure. the back of each side? This is if you want to get onto the Free Software Foundation's announcement list. And we have one or two announcements per month, a regular one and occasionally something special. Uh, so look at gnu.org slash help, and you'll be able to uh, look for some kind of work you'd like to do for us. In slash philosophy, you'll find all the articles about philosophical questions and political questions related to free software. In slash licenses, you'll find everything about which licenses are free and how to use them and so on. In slash government, you'll find proposed policies for moving the government to free software. Of course, it's going to take years to do that. Uh, if you tried to do it in a week, you'd just get in trouble. Uh, but better slowly than not at all. Slash education talks about schools, including many examples of schools that have migrated. Slash GNU gives the history of the GNU system. Slash malware gives hundreds of examples of malicious functionalities in proprietary software. And slash distros gives information about the various GNU slash Linux distros and some other systems distros as well, which ones are free and which are not. We also have the site fsf.org. In fsf.org slash resources, you can find lots of resources for using and developing free software, including information about what hardware to use free software with. You can also, in fsf.org, send a donation. You can join as an associate member. We also have a shop. Normally, I would have been selling to you some little cheap items, but it's forbidden. How sad. But you can get it from there. Uh, also, if you want to join as a member, you can do that here paying cash because I have some cards you can fill out, which will do this. Now, I wanted to tell you 
about some other threats uh, Particular, particularly about Canada, there's a threat of copyright extension. Uh, the U.S. is trying to bully Canada into making copyright last too longer. It lasts too long, far too long already. It needs to be shortened, not lengthened. But I have a proposal to make. Basically, if Canada agrees to this treaty, it could change the law to say, copyright will last either this long or until that time or whenever this treaty is no longer in force. So copyright would last longer but only if the treaty is still in force at the time. And that way if Canada ever uh, withdraws from that treaty or it expires or whatever, uh, then the extension will not remain in effect. You see, the problem with copyright is uh, it's legally difficult to shorten copyrights on existing works. But this way, if the law prepares to pull the length back, supposing the treaty were, uh, were canceled, then it would be possible. This is important to spread the word about. Now, uh, Another uh, thing I wanted to mention was business supremacy treaties and uh, tar sands oil. A business supremacy treaty is a treaty that gives business more power over the state. These are usually called free trade agreements, but a lot of them has really nothing to do with free trade, and their main purpose is just to give businesses more power that they shouldn't have. I saw an article suggesting that Canada may have an obligation to China under one of these treaties to continue selling a certain quantity of petroleum or, be, uh, or owe billions of dollars to China. And that this might be the reason why Trudeau took over the building of the tar sands oil pipeline. Now, of course, extracting tar sands is basically destroying civilization. Uh, several years ago, it was recognized that we had to leave 80% of the known fossil fuel reserves in the ground to avoid worldwide disaster. Uh, by now, it's probably more than 80%. Now, the tar sands oil involves uh, the highest level, I think it's comparable to coal, of emissions per unit energy. So when you start looking around which deposits do we have to leave in the ground, you have to start with the tar sands. And that 80% is going to go far beyond the tar sands. None of that should be extracted. Now, many people don't realize how disastrous this is going to be, but uh, in a few decades, all the coral on Earth will die because the ocean will get so acidic that they won't be able to build shells anymore. All the mollusks with shells will die too. Well, lots of other species in the ocean depend on coral reefs, especially either they live in coral reefs or very young live in coral reefs. So a lot of the food that people get from the sea will not be there anymore. And this is not to mention unpredictable disasters like uh, all the sea stars on the west coast of the U.S. died. Uh, there was a, basically, they all caught a virus. Now, why didn't they get that virus and die before? It was the temperature. And they're still surviving off the Canadian coast, but that's not going to last for many decades, of course. Sorry, you've got to let me do what I've got to do. Uh, you watch out for the uh, for people who are saying they're opposing the uh, spy city sidewalk labs plan by regulating how the data is used. It's too late. Uh, where is the... Oh, there is a brown bag that I brought with me. Could someone bring it here? That has the GNU that I'm going to uh, auction. 
You see, that's an inadequate solution. You can't solve this problem by regulating the use of the data, and partly it's because the state is going to give itself access for purposes such as repressing dissidents and uh, prosecuting whistleblowers, heroes like Snowden. And so if you want democracy and freedom of expression, you've got to prevent anyone from keeping track of who goes where, what they do there, and who they talk with. Those are the most sensitive daily activity uh, data that we must pre prevent from being collected at all. So uh, any system that collects that, that's a threat to your freedom. And whatever benefit they claim they're going to get from that, it's not worth it. That's a side issue. Don't let them. 